Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NRMCA's webinar, Designing Concrete Parking Lots and Streets. My name is Phil Kresge. I'm Senior Vice President of Local Paving for the National Ready Mix Concrete Association. And with me today is Amanda Holt, who is the Senior Director of Local Paving. And, and Amanda will be giving a the brunt of the presentation. I do have some housekeeping that I want to go through first uh, before we get started. And the first is uh, regarding the presentation itself. Uh, everyone muted. Uh, we've got quite a few folks. Uh, we're, we're well over 400 people and I think that's fantastic and I appreciate the interest in the topic. But we're going to keep everyone muted and if you have questions, uh, please type the questions into the question box. We're going to, at the end of the session, we'll take a, a, take a look at the uh, questions and try to answer all of them. We'll make sure that no questions are left unanswered. Uh, we are also recording the webinar and afterwards you will be able to uh, upload or download a copy of the, the webinar on our NRMCA YouTube channel. It'll take a couple of days to get that up, uh, but it'll be uploaded. And uh, also, there are a couple of handouts uh, right now that you can access uh, in the, if you look on your toolbar, uh, there are two handouts there. One is a out of the presentation, so you have the slides there. Uh, and the other is uh, uh, contact information on the Pave Ahead team. Uh, as far as the course uh, credit is concerned, it does have continuing education credits. It's uh, based on your attendance. And uh, after the, the webinar is completed, you'll get a, an email, follow-up email with a survey, uh, some quiz, some questions there. We would ask you to please fill those out. It's not required, but we certainly encourage you to fill those out. We use that information to improve our our survey, our uh, webinars rather. As far as the certificate goes, about an hour after the webinar, you'll get a follow-up email. And in that email, you'll be able to get your certificate for your continuing education for your PDH. If you are an AIA member and you provided us your AIA number, we will register that with the American Institute of Architects. The presentation, as all presentations from NRMCA, uh, we strive to be as accurate as we can but uh, we disclaim any responsibility for your application of the information. And also because there are so many folks here, I need to let you know that we're gonna abide by the NRMCA's antitrust policy. We are gonna refrain from discussing costs, actual costs and so on. Uh, if you're looking for estimates on what the costs of concrete pavement might be, my recommendation would be to reach out to your local ready mix producer or concrete paving contractor and they can give you uh, some examples there. I want to take the time to thank our sponsors, uh, BASF Master Builders, Euclid Chemical, uh, GCP Applied Technologies and SECA. Without their continued support, we at NRMCA wouldn't be able to provide a lot of the, the uh, resources we do and we thank them for that. Our agenda for today, uh, we're going to finish up here in a little bit with some introductions of NRMCA and our speaker. Uh, and then Amanda is going to come in and talk about uh, why we are here, the, the reason for this type of, of presentation. Uh, we'll, she'll talk about the design elements of a concrete parking lot and concrete streets, uh, the different design tools. And then I'll come in at the end and review some of the resources that are available from the NRMCA. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with NRMCA, we are a national trade association. We've been around, this is our 90th year. Uh, we are currently housed in Alexandria, Virginia, after many years of being in Silver Spring, Maryland. But we're right there uh, in the Beltway, and we're there for a reason, because we represent the concrete industry, um, not only in, in engineering and promotion, but also in government affairs. And uh, we're there to be the voice of the industry in Washington. We currently have a, about 1,100 member companies, and they represent 75 to 80% of the North American production of ready mixed concrete. Our mission is to serve the industry and our partners, and we do that through our five divisions, compliance and operations, where we assist you being better at business, uh, with engineering, where we represent the concrete industry at ACI, ASTM, uh, and other organizations. Our government 
Fed represents and defends, if you will, the industry uh, uh, on Capitol Hill and supporting uh, on a local level. And then our two promotion divisions, structures and sustainability, which is pretty much self-explanatory, and then local paving, which covers uh, parking lots, streets, roads. We don't get into uh, mainline paving as much. We have other associations, American Concrete Pavement Association, for example, that we partner with there, but we lead the charge on the local paving. And our local paving team consists of uh, professionals around the country. We are, I'm not, uh, I guess I'm not egotistical here, but we feel like our team has some of the best that the industry has to offer. We've got years here and we're here to support and help uh, our members and our contractors and our customers all that we can. A little bit about our speaker today, Amanda Halt is a graduate of the University of Florida. Uh, prior to coming to the NRMCA, she spent nine years in land development and three years in market development and parking lot promotions for a, uh, one of the larger cement manufacturers. Since joining NRMCA and being a, the Senior Director of Local Paving, she focuses on the streets and roads and parking lots promotion. Uh, she's quite well versed in new construction and overlays and rehabilitation. And as far as industry support goes, uh, Amanda is our lead on the design assistance program, which you're going to hear about a little bit later. And so with that, I will introduce to you Amanda Holt. All right, thanks, Phil. I appreciate that. So everybody is here today for a purpose, and we're gonna we're gonna really dive into um, looking at uh, concrete uh, parking lots as well as streets. So the purpose of this web is to sit through today, and we we go over some of the design basics of both parking lots and concrete streets. We hope that you can then um, be able to take the the information that's provided and then use the appropriate pavement design methods. Uh, for both of these types of, of pavement applications, as well as the identifying which inputs are necessary to do a well-designed concrete uh, segment. So education is uh, for concrete pavements is very, very important. And in, in many aspects, we actually lack in, in the college or the universities uh, exposure to these different types of um, education opportunities. And because of that, we end up seeing that we have um, concrete sections that are not equivalent to those of the of asphalt. Um, pr primarily, that is what we are up against in the market of pavements. And so we get a concrete versus an asphalt parking or a either a parking or a streets and local roads um, section. And they, you know, they're, they're not structurally equivalent, but we want the initial cost to be to be rather competitive. And, and, and we, can, that we can't make that happen in most cases. And so we really need to look at the structural components of both of those and, and get a really more of an apples to apples comparison. I want to start off by um, addressing the slide um, regarding who designs pavements. This is um, a slide that I really like to talk about and, and really kind of dig down into it. And depending on where you are, um, in the design uh, layout of a project is going to have a very different um, aspect um, of, of, what, of how you see these, these different roles played out. Um, from, again, my background, I did land development in the Jacksonville, Florida area for, for years before I came into the industry. And so my um, relationship with an architect, they were typically the one that had the ear of the owner. And so um, they really didn't get into design too much. Now, in my travels across the U.S. with uh, NRMCA, I have found architects that do um, do the pavement design. And so it's important that those architects are exposed to the different elements that go in um, to the design so that they know um, what they're looking for and how to properly design it. Um, but for the most part, from the architect at the loads um, or the vehicles, what we're going to be designing our parking lot for. Um, the geotechnical engineer, I feel that you guys have, if there's any geotechnical engineers with us today, I feel that like you have a very important uh, role in this, um, in, in, in the project. 
as a, as a designer, I relied very heavily on the geotechnical engineers. And I'm going to say, if you could see me, I would do my air quotes of um, the recommendations. Um, because I say that because a lot of uh, civil engineers, they will not take the responsibility of doing the pavement design. They actually say that they get it from the geotechnical engineers. I've spoken to many geotechnical engineers in the US that say that they don't do the designs, they just provide recommendations. So if you're a geotechnical engineer, I want to um, express the um, importance of understanding the correct way to design a parking lot or a, a concrete street just for the fact that there is a lot of civil engineers out there that are relying on your recommendations. So um, a very, very important role. For the civil engineer, um, Ultimately, your stamp is going to be on the plans um, for the, um, the pavement details. So it's very important to um, have an idea uh, and, and, a, and a good knowledge of how to properly design a concrete pavement. Now, here, um, this one was kind of new to me. And so I talked it around with my teammates. And the structural engineer, um, if they are the ones that are doing the design for um, the pavement, um, you're probably going to see a large ticket item under the reinforcement. A lot of times they will they will design the exterior slabs like they would an interior with a lot of extra reinforcement that's not necessary. And we'll talk about reinforcement um, in just a little bit. Um, from a contractor's perspective, um, the biggest thing that, that you need to be concerned with is that joint layout plan, um, as well as the other finishing aspects to a concrete pavement. But you should never go onto a site getting ready to place concrete without a joint plan already um, in your hands and, and fully um, examined and having any questions addressed beforehand. So um, again, those are those are different aspects of the project, um, and I and I um, encourage each of you to to really kind of think about where your role is in that um, that what I call the the project food chain. All right, so the first thing that we're going to address is concrete streets. Um, I'm going to just touch on the streets aspect here shortly, um, just a couple of slides, and then I really want to dive into um, the other ACI document for parking lots. There's a little bit of overlap as far as the inputs, and so we'll talk about those um, really briefly here, um, but we'll get into that here in a second in more detail. So ACI 325.12. R-02 is the current guide for design of jointed concrete pavements for streets and local roads. So if you're designing a concrete street or a concrete local um, road, then this is the document that you would need to go to. It gets a little confusing if you're not familiar with the ACI documents because there's a lot of, of different numbers and, and whatnot identifiers um, for these, these different documents. But basically, this is a committee that's put forth um, to um, to provide the guidelines for paving uh, local streets and roads. And the primary uh, distress that this document, the 325, um, um, addresses is um, but it does, does make note of other distresses such as spalling or fault um, that do occur. But this is, is really um, primarily based on um, mid-slab cracking. So there's thickness design charts and, uh, and within the 325 document, and they are based on axle load distributions. Um, both this document and the next document that we're going to be talking about do have appendices with the, with the axle uh, load distributions in there. So if you are someone that's very interested in, in what type of, of vehicles are, you, are being calculated in these designs, you can go back to the appendix um, on both of the documents and, and research that. One of the other big um, inputs that we have for pavement design is traffic. Um, this is a, a table out of 325 for streets and local roads. You'll see the different street classifications there. Um, average daily truck traffic is, a very, is one of the key ingredients that we need to design a concrete pavement. Um, so this is, again, the chart for the streets and local roads. You'll need to know what type of, of, of street your pavement is going to service. Um, and then we'll look at here in a minute um, how, that difference, how that differs for parking lots. So there's two basic charts that you will use in 325 uh, depending on your um, support edge. So the first one here is 3.2A, um, 
And this is going to be for a pavement that has an integral or a tied curb and gutter or a shoulder. So basically that edge is going to be supported. Um, and then there is another um, chart that you could use, the 3.2B, and this is without a curb or gutter. So if, you're, if you have a tendency then for those vehicles to encroach on that edge, you're going to have str uh, higher stresses along the edge. And so if you compare those two charts, you will see that you will have thicker pavements with that unsupported edge, just the, kind of the difference between the two. So that's just a um, view of the, of the Streets and Local Roads Guide. Again, there's a lot of overlap when it comes to the key elements for design in the two. Um, and so I'm really going to dive in much deeper with the 330 um, uh, design guide. And we'll look at this one. We'll kind of tear it apart and look at those elements that can also be used in that 325 guide. So ACI 330 R-08. So this um, is letting you know that this isn't the R is a report, and the 08 is the year that it was published. So this particular guide was um, published in 2008. The committee just met um, yesterday, um, and we are currently re uh, revising this uh, document. Um, and our fingers are crossed that we will have publication with a 2020 date. Um, so we're, we're working very hard on getting this out. But this is a document that you will use specifically for concrete parking lots. This is the only document available and um, out there for concrete parking lots. So um, if I could talk to you and have you guys talk back to me, my question that I always ask, and the answer is right here on the screen, is what does the H stand for in AASHTO? The H is for highway. Um, a lot of times when we read specs or we read the geotechnical reports, um, we will see DOT or AASHTO, AASHTO 93 design guide used for concrete pavement design um, for parking lots. And that's really, um, I equate it to, I like this. And so that's like, like trying to take a, a brownie mix um, with this whole shut-in. My kids are loving to, to make desserts. They take a box of brownie mix and they follow the directions and they put it in the oven and they hope that when the buzzer goes off, it, they open the drawer and it's a cake. It's a vanilla funfetti cake mix. They're going to be disappointed. They will get dessert. They're both desserts, but they are two different types of desserts. If you design a concrete parking lot with, with an Astro 93 um, guide, you're going to get a concrete uh, parking lot, but you're going to get something that's pretty significantly over-designed. And so when we look at that initial cost comparison, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to be able to compete with anything um, as far as uh, the initial cost. So let's, um, so when you look at a highway design, highways are typically high rates of speed. They're going in one, dire uh, one directional um, direction, traffic pattern. Um, there's uh, a lot of times, you know, there's there's, especially on highways, there's not a lot of curb and gutter, um, and so you're going to have that, that shoulder. So you're going to have a little bit more of that wandering uh, tendency to the edges. So you're going to have higher um, stresses. You're also going to have a very high number, um, a high volume of the, the truck traffic, a lot more so than you would see for a typical parking lot. Um, you know, in a parking lot, when you look at a design, if, you ever, if you've talked to an architect or if you're an architect, one of the things that they like to do when you've got a lot of pedestrian traffic is to slow down the traffic flow. Um, so they do that with a, a multiple different ways. So the speed aspect, again, it's, it's completely in, in contrast to what we would see in a highway. Um, they, we paint arrows um, for direction flow in a parking lot with the, ten, with the hopes that people will follow them. I'm 5'1 and drive a Suburban. I'm all over that uh, parking lot. I use those arrows as recommendations. I don't, uh, there's a, there's a um, an inconsistent traffic flow in the parking lot, um, unlike what we would see in a, in a highway type element. So again, this is a, yes, it's a way to, to design a pavement, but it's not it's not the right way to design a concrete parking lot. So some key terminology that we need to know. So we're basically starting to build our, our model so how we can go in and do a concrete uh, design. One of the first things that we need to know is the average daily truck traffic. Um, this is not your Bubba pickup truck. This is not your, um, your standard cars that we see on the roads. These are more of your semis, your garbage trucks. These are more of your heavy loads. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in what um, goes into those traf the traffic spectrums, 
um, you can uh, look at reference the appendix in the back of the document. So we're going to look at the average daily truck traffic. Now this is an average. Um, when we do our design, you'll see that for the 330.8 um, or the, the 08 guide, it's 20 years, um, assuming that traffic every day for 20 years. The modulus of rupture, this is the flexural strength. So if you are somewhat familiar with concrete, pay, or concrete in general, a lot of times you'll hear 3,500, 4,000 PSI. Those are compressive strengths. Um, the way that the charts are set up, it talks in flexural strength. So modulus of rupture is, um, can also be described as flexural strength. So when we start looking at the chart, we're going to look at something that says 550 PSI. Please make, make yourself, uh, make a note that that is not compressive strength. That is flexural strength. Here in a minute. Table 3.3 in the um, 08 guide um, is the traffic categories. So we have our average daily truck traffic. That is the frequency of those large trucks. We need to decide what category we're going to use. So um, the different categories are there on your screen. If we're going to design for a, um, a library or a dentist office, we're going to look at category A. If we're going to design for the um, service lane on the outskirts that takes you um, around the different shops in that, that shopping center, then we're going to use for that. Um, you can have multiple traffic categories within um, and that is one thing that we like to stress is do not think that one size fits all um, and if you're looking for um, an economic design you will you will do your owner a favor by breaking up your site depending on its, its needs. Another um, element that we need to look at is the subgrade um, uh, terminology. So Two of the most common types that we find in the geotech report or references is a little k, the modulus of subgrade reaction, which is which is the equivalent, or if when you want to think about what it is, you can compare it to the springs in a mattress or the spring, any kind of a spring. When you push down on the couch or the mattress, those springs are pushing up at some sort of a, a force. And so that, that um, pressure that you're feeling the springs um, provide is your K value. So it's the, the, basically the spring constant of your soils. The other one that we commonly see is CBR value, your California bearing ratio. Um, and um, again, th those are the two most common types. Now, if you're on the, the webinar today from Florida, you guys like LBR, the lime rock bearing ratio. Um, you're probably, the, I think you're the only state that I've ever come in contact um, with that uses that. And there is a conversion out there um, to get you from an LBR over to the K or CBR. Um, if you don't have these, these um, elements in your geotech report or you have not been given that information by the owner, um, you can go to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's um, soil conservation site and you can get a description of the um, native soils in that, in that area. Or you can look at, if you've got boring logs, you can look at the descriptions that are provided to you um, in that log. And then by doing that, then you can come into the table 3.1 and you can do an analysis and look and see, okay, what type of soils best describes what I've been given? If I know nothing about a site um, and I'm just doing some preliminary back of the napkin type design, I will typically assume a CBR of three. And you'll see right here in this, table right here, a CBR of three is kind of in the middle of the lowest support type soils. So we'll, we'll go on a CBR of three and then once more information is provided to us, then we can, we can make those adjustments. So that's a pretty good um, assumption to begin with. So this is a, a standard table from the ACI 330R-08 guideline. This table is for unreinforced concrete, plain gray concrete, sitting on compacted subgrade. Um, and so um, this is kind of what I would consider a base model for a car. We always start with this, but then we look at each project individually and we, we deciphered is there other elements that needed to be add, um, added to the section. Just like when you buy a car, you buy the base model and then you can upgrade your, your car depending on what suits your needs. Same type of thing with a, a concrete parking lot design. You'll see that this is broken up into six different um, sections, and they're all based on that soils category. 
So earlier I told you that if I did not know the, the soils uh, information, I would make an assumption of a K of 100 or a CBR of 3. So that will throw us down into this box right here. So this is the box that we're going to use here. The modulus of rupture, remember I said that was your flexural strength. So we're going to be in one of these four um, columns right here. Now there's two equations that will equate the modulus of rupture or the flexural strength to compressive strength. It's either eight or ten times the square root of compressive strength is what your, your flexural strength is going to be. Roughly speaking, a 550 um, PSI is between 550 and a 600 PSI is going to be a 4,000 um, PSI compressive strength concrete. Um, for this example, we're going to use a, um, which we're going to run through an example here real quick. Um, we're going to use the 550 PSI um, flexural strength for our example. The next thing we need to evaluate is our traffic category over here. So if we are going to be designing, we're going to say let's use our example as a dentist's office. A dentist's office may get garbage pickup once a week if it's a small practice um, and that they're, they're separate. Um, so we're going to say that this is a, a kind of an independent little um, office with um, very, very minor delivery. Um, and our biggest truck will be our garbage truck. So we're going to say, um, we're going to do a category A for, for the site. And we're going to do an average daily truck traffic of one. Now, when we, when we put those inputs into this chart, you're, you're going to see that our resulting thickness is four and a half inches of 550 PSI flexural strength concrete, unreinforced, and at this point sitting on compacted subgrades. Now, if you're a designer on the phone, please don't have, um, please don't pass out when you see four and a half inches. Um, I know when I do this uh, presentation in person, I get a lot of head nods, no, shaking their head, no, back and forth, because a lot of um, a lot of designers have a six inch thick minimum. Um, that's their rule of thumb. Um, but I do want to stress to you that um, when you look at this design, there's a lot of um, factors of safety or rounding that is put into these designs. Uh, just like we estimated a CBR of three, more than likely we'll say that we'll say that it comes back to the report that it's a CBR of five. Okay, so we are we're being conservative there. If you order a four thousand PSI compressive concrete mix um, maturity, the twenty eight days, you're gonna be well over PSI um, strength. We also, for the traffic, we said one truck per day. Again, that's for 20 years every day. And so you can see when all of these elements are, are um, put into this chart, we've got a lot of, a lot of um, conservatism built in. So you can rest assured, if you've got a good four and a half inch thick uh, concrete section that's placed properly, it will, um, it will provide you the necessary um, platform for the traffic conditions that you've specified here. And I'm going to challenge you, if you stick with me um, when we start looking at software, I challenge you to, uh, there'll be a challenge at that point, for you to kind of go in and, and if you say, no, I'll never design a four and a half inch thick pavement, I want to challenge you to, to do something here in a minute. Um, when we get there, I'll point it out to you. So thickness design is really just step one. There's a, there's a lot of other elements. Like I said earlier, we built the base model of our car. But now we're going to really start diving in and looking at the different elements um, that can be added to our, our section. Some of the common questions that we have is um, about the sub-base. I know in some parts of the country, um, they would not even consider putting concrete down without some sort of an aggregate layer. Um, I know in some portions of the country, there is absolutely terrible soils, um, a lot of um, expansive soil. So there might be something that needs to happen to the subbase. Um, fibers, fibers are something else that we're seeing come um, through the, the industry that ha it's changed dramatically in my time that I've been within the industry. I know when I started about 11 years ago, almost 12 years ago in the industry, I didn't hear a whole lot about fibers, but I see very little being built today without fibers. So we'll look at that. Well, the wire mesh, and then, and then another, another um, very important topic is jointing. We'll, we'll, we'll hit a little bit of um, jointing uh, information today, but I do want to, um, I will remind you about a, a webinar that we have coming up specifically on jointing. 
But the first thing that we need to do is we need to uh, establish that concrete pavements and asphalt pavements feel the stress load different. And that's noted by that red um, stress underneath the, 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 of the pavement. So when the, when the wheel load comes over the concrete section, the concrete itself carries the majority of that wheel load. The stress then penetrates just into, slightly into that um, underlying layer. That's why it's so critical for concrete that we are put on a uniformly compacted subgrade. Whether it's 95, 98, 99%, it just needs to be a level uh, or a, um, a uniformly compacted um, surface. For asphalt, each layer in itself is very weak, and so it needs all of those supporting layers to help hold that wheel load or that, that load that's um, coming across up. Um, and so you can see that by the, the deep dip in that red um, stress model. Um, like I said earlier, uh, fibers, we're seeing fibers used a lot. I know um, in the new document that, um, that I had mentioned, the, the uh, 330.08 document, um, there will be a whole section for fibers. Um, they're used for different reasons, um, most commonly for to help with the plastic shrinkage uh, cracking. If you have any questions uh, diving into fibers anymore, just send us an email um, or you can type a question. We can definitely get you in contact um, with a ready mix producer or a fiber um, person in your area a fiber distributor, and then you can um, find out a lot more in depth fibers. This is an element that I see a lot of times come up in, in those cross sections when I'm reviewing plans. We see what a wire mesh in the majority of plans, and when you really talk to designers, they don't know why. Um, they copied and pasted, and they really never gave a second thought to what was in their section. The problem that we get with welded wire mesh or the steel reinforcement is that a lot of times it gets embedded in the subgrade or it's at the very bottom of the concrete. Um, as you can see in the, in the picture on the right-hand side, it has to be in the, the upper third of that section or the upper half of that section in order to really be able to do anything. Um, but 330 says, hey, you really don't need this. Um, you can um, cut your joints closer together and that will help um, with that, that joint. Um, being being close together. So if you're looking at your section and you're really trying to identify the, the elements that are not necessary, this is one where I would I would um, think that you could probably spend some time in researching and, and be able to eliminate it from your section. Dowels are another area that we're commonly asked about. Dowels and, and tie bars. Um, we don't really discuss tie bars in this um, presentation. So I just want to address that really quick um, without a slide. But tie bars tie. So when you think about um, a um, like an entrance drive into, we'll say, into like a fast food restaurant, a lot of times they're about 24 feet wide. And if you have a longitudinal joint cutting that 24-foot driveway in half, so you've got two 12-foot panels. If there's no edge constraint, you're going to have a tendency for the momentum of those cars to push that outer panel away. You put tie bars in that longitudinal joint and it will tie those two slabs together and it will help with the horizontal drift. Now tie bars do not provide um, vertical um, load transfer. So tie bars are horizontal. If you have a lot of trucks, you need dowels. So dowels will help you um, with the um, deflection that you would get from one slab to the next. And this is addressed in section 3.8.2. Now you'll see by this um, table, this is a table for the design for smooth round dowels. It does not go, um, it does not provide you any recommendations for slab thicknesses less than seven inches. So if you're designing a project and you've got um, five inches of concrete and you have dowels, I can, pretty much guarantee you, you, you do not need round um, dowels in there. Um, again, the, the, the dowels will be, uh, one of the, the main um, requirements for dowels is gonna be your truck traffic. So when you start looking at 100, 150 semi trucks per day, you're gonna get a lot of movement between those two slabs and that's gonna require some dowels. 
So there are some instances where, if in, in going back to that, if you put a round dowel in like a, a six inch thick pavement or any, even less than that, you don't have adequate concrete cover over that dowel. So once you start running a lot of heavy truck traffic, you're going to have a, a higher potential for cracking directly above that dowel. So um, there are some times, though, that you may have 100 to 150 trucks per day, but you're going to come in in that six, six and a half inch um, thick concrete section range. And it's during those times that we see plate dowels used. Now, they were typically used in more of the interior pavements, but we're seeing these used a lot on the exterior um, application. So you've got a thinner cross section, a larger surface area, and that's going to help you with that load transfer from slab to slab. So again, um, round dowels may not be, um, it, it's not necessary in anything less than seven inches. If you're in that gray area where you've got the truck tra traffic that would uh, warrant dowels, this is the, the way you're going to want to go with the plate dowels. If you have any questions on doweling, the, the 08 document does not get real detailed with it. There's a new document that's coming out that I'll address here in a second um, that goes um, into much greater detail about dowels. Um, and so you can get that document, a third document that we'll talk about, um, and look at that for more doweling research. Jointing, um, this is uh, one of the, the last topics that we're going to talk about um, before we go into the software. But jointing is extremely important. If we put the, we design the concrete thickness correctly, we place it, um, you know, correctly, we cure it, but we don't joint it at the right time, the location and the depth, we could have a potential problem on our hands. I do want to make you guys aware that there is a one hour webinar on Thursday, April 23rd at 2 p.m on jointing. It'll be specifically an hour on jointing. So I want to I wanna make you aware of that. So we're going to talk about the three main types of joints. The first one is a contraction joint or a control joint. I say that a, um, a, con a control joint is nothing more than a pretty crack. If an owner walks out into their, their parking lot and they see um, random cracking, they're going to tell you that there's something wrong with their concrete. If the owner walks out and sees a cut joint, they're not going to think anything about it. And they're really doing serving the same purpose. They're relieving the stress of, of, the, problem, of the concrete as it's going through that drying and the shrinking um, process. Um, with the control joints, again, just like their name says, we have the opportunity to control where they go. And we also have the, the chance to, um, to control their thickness or their depth. Um, the minimum depth, depth that those joints seem to be cut is a quarter of the thickness. So if you've got um, a four inch thick pavement, then you're going to go one inch deep. We are seeing some indus industries uh, standards going to a third of the thickness, um, but a quarter of the thickness is your minimum. Some rules of thumb is the horizontal spacing. So I, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, when I get, if I get a call about a, a parking lot that's cracked, there's a couple, there's about probably about three different scenarios that we look at to see if there, if any of those are contributing factors to cracking. One of them is the depth that we just talked about, and there's a way to measure that. The other one is the horizontal spacing. Um, the maximum joint spacing for um, your four and four and a half inch thick pavements are ten, are ten feet horizontally. And we'll look at, um, there's a, a, a table that's in 330. Um, that I'll show you on the next slide, but basically your horizontal spacing, we can measure that as well um, for another co uh, contributing factor to, to um, cracks. The third one we can't measure, it's where it's, well, you can measure it, but it's really on um, observation is the timing. Um, and we'll talk about what happens if you don't get it in the right timing. Um, but going back to the, the depth, we've already addressed that, um, a quarter of the thickness, um, and then um, keeping your panels as square as possible. Um, and then the big one, that the rule breaker of this is sidewalks. We have, um, I've seen many sidewalks where they may be four feet wide, five feet wide, but then they're going to go 15 feet before they put a joint. If you get even a heavy loaded um, work truck in the middle of that panel, you're going to have a, a significant increase of probability for a crack in that um, mid panel. This is a table I alluded to just a minute ago. This is the maximum joint spacing um, depending on your thickness. 
we always recommend that you pull back from that maximum space. So if you are dealing with a five, th five inch thick concrete pavement, the maximum joint spacing would be 12 and a half feet. When laying out a joint plan, I always recommend pull that back. Pull that back to maybe 12 or 11 feet, depending on the way that your site plan is laid out. Yes, it may cost you a more for a few extra cuts, um, but as any designer, as anybody that works in construction knows, if you put a manhole on paper, it's probably going to move slightly in the field. And so this way it gives a little bit of flexibility for the contractor when they're making the cut so they have a little bit of flexibility without exceeding those maximums. The next kind of joint that I'm going to talk about is a construction joint or a cold joint. This is basically from placement to placement. You'll notice that it's squared off. It looks different than that control joint that we saw earlier. There's no load transfer for in, in the cold joint itself, um, or we also call them the butt joint. If this is an area that's going to have more truck traffic, then we need to look at maybe putting in a dowel um, to help with that load transfer because there's no aggregate interlock there. Um, it's, it's, it's a squared off edge. If it's in an area that's going to be light traffic, then we need to look at maybe um, doing a thickened edge, and I'll show you the detail for that here in a minute. But that's a butt joint. In my travels across the U.S. and looking at a lot of projects, I see a lot of call, call outs for keyways. Keyways are no longer recommended um, in um, parking lots, and I believe that the only thing that I could find really was when it's looking at eight inches or, or greater in it more of a mainline type paving application. So if you currently design using keyways, you, um, I, I urge you to go and research the section in the 330 document that talks about keyways in section 3.7.2. Go take a look at that. And if you have any questions after you read it, um, I'll be more than happy to talk it over with you. The last joint that we're gonna talk about is an isolation joint. Um, sometimes they're called expansion joints. They're used interchangeably, but they really provide different, um, they really have different jobs. An isolation joint does just what its name says. It isolates the new fresh concrete from any fixed structure. So you can see in the, the image here, the detail that we are, we are separating that new fresh concrete from the existing structure. If we don't, say that that structure is a column, if we do not have that isolation joint material in between those two um, structures, if one of them settles, if the, if the column were to settle the, and the concrete was basically stuck to that, that um, column, then there's gonna be that, that, that concrete pavement is going to then settle with it. And so there's gonna be significant, significant cracking in that area. If you've separated those two structures with um, joint uh, isolation joint material, then it allows them to move somewhat independently. So if you've got a column, then that settles. It allows the concrete pavement to stay uh, pretty much intact at its at its um, constructed elevation and without doing a significant having a significant amount of um, cracking. And that's gonna you're gonna use this isolation um, material around any fixed structure. So if you've got um, light poles, you've got um, drainage structures, anything like that that's going to be in the pavement, um, then you need to make sure that it is fully wrapped with the isolation material. So looking at our um, some, some photos of, of what to do and what not to do, um, the upper left picture, this is an integral curb. It's placed um, uh, integrally with the concrete uh, parking lot itself. Um, and when we, when we draw this on the plans, we are gonna make sure that we are showing our joints going all the way through the back of curb. And um, we wanna try to make that one continuous cut as much as possible. The middle right picture, um, if we would have continued extending these cuts out straight, then we would have had a small tri triangular area right there. And we would have had several acute angles which would have resulted in um, usually find small cracking um, to happen there. Instead, we fill it or fillet, however you wanna say it, in AutoCAD. We met the, we joined these two um, saw cuts about a foot and a half, um, two feet away from the face of curb. We then went perpendicular into that curb and then followed through all the way to the back of curb. If you remember back to your geometry days, anything that, that goes in at a perpendicular will um, goes in at 90 degree angles so it avoids any type of acute angles. 
We want to make sure that we um, try to hit corners as much as possible um, with our joints. Now, if you've ever been responsible for a joint plan, you can you understand, and, and I totally empathize with you on trying to lay out joints. It can be a pretty tedious um, adventure, uh, and I'll use adventure um, lightly, but it's, you, it, it can take hours and hours, and, and really with the way that the site, the site plans are made today, it's gonna be nearly impossible to get a perfect joint uh, layout. Um, but it's really about evaluating what is going to be the best scenario for your pavement. Um, if you've got to bend the rolls any, it's best to try to bend them in the light duty area or areas where it's going to see minimal traffic. Um, we really, you want to really focus especially hard on those areas with the heavy truck traffic to make sure we've got good jointing practices in those areas. Just a, uh, another, a couple other um, pictures here. Um, we've got a drainage structure here. Uh, we missed the corner. Um, and you can see the concrete did exactly what we know it's going to do. It's going to go to the edge of that that uh, structure. Um, if the owner sees this, you're probably going to get a call about it. Their concrete's broken. Um, but we know that that um, random crack is serving the same purpose as a saw cut. It's just in the wrong location. So trying to come off at a at a good angle and then come to the corner. We like to see something on the other corners as well. Um, as far as joint cuts um, going up to those other corners. Now, I don't know the story behind this picture, but you can see once again, this uh, concrete pavement cracked pretty much where we thought it would be as far as coming into this um, outer boundary at a perpendicular. Now, if there's no type of um, uh, steel in here, then this piece right here, this corner piece is gonna have a tendency to fall off and it's gonna be displaced. So if you've got certain scenarios where you know you cannot avoid these acute angles, you know there's gonna be a high probability of cracking because of the, the joint layouts, then you want to go ahead and put some sort of a, a steel in there. So if this happens, it will then still, it will stay together and it won't um, have an issue with, with coming off. All right, so this is the, um, thickened edge uh, detail that I was telling you about before. So if you have, in this case, in this case uh, in scenario, we have a free edge um, on the left-hand side here. We know, like I had mentioned earlier, we start doing the, the, the traffic wandering. As we get closer to that edge of that pavement, the stresses go up. Therefore, you would need a thicker pavement to be able to handle those, those stresses. By um, transitioning into a thicker pavement over a thickened, with the thickened edge, it then provides additional support for that uh, wheel load. Here is an isolation joint. So this would be in a, um, a light duty application. Isolation joint, um, instead of uh, keeping it um, flat on the bottom, we've transitioned. And again, that is going to provide more integrity, structural integrity to the section by putting more concrete on that, that edge. There is no load transfer um, the way that this this um, detail has been drawn across the isolation joint. So a couple of design tools that we have for you. The first one I'm gonna talk about is the Concrete Pavement Analyst. This is a um, software that NRMCA has. If you are interested in the software, please send me an email and we'll um, see what we can do to get that out to you. This is a, a software that has to be downloaded. We have, we're trying to eventually go to a web-based um, application, but this one right now is downloaded. This is not a design tool. This is a um, more of a uh, comparison tool, and I'm going to show you, I alluded to this earlier, um, the way that I like to use this tool specifically. Um, but basically, you go in, this is the opening page, you put your project, basic project information in here, you would click on the pavement design um, tab, and then that's where you put in your, um, your uh, project information as far as um, as the the traffic count you're going to put your concrete information in there your soils and your traffic count um, and then the concrete strength the three the three main elements that we see um, for concrete pavement design and then the last one that I'm going to show you here um, closer is this locally specific design and this is where we get into that comparison. The comparisons are made on structural numbers. So if it's been a while since you or you've never heard of structural numbers, let me give you a, a two second crash course. Basically each layer of pavement, concrete and asphalt, um, and, and the, the material below it are um, 
assigned a coefficient um, for that type of material. So when you go in, um, for instance, concrete um, is um, the, the, the coefficient that is in the pavement designer, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, concrete pavement analyst is 0.5. So that is its coefficient. To find the structural number of a four inch thick concrete pavement, you would take four inches and you would multiply it times that 0.5. So your structural number of a four inch thick pavement would be two. For an asphalt, you would take it for each of those individual layers, multiply each layer thickness by its um, coefficient, and then add them all together. So if you come to this lo locally specific design, this is where you have the opportunity to put in your asphalt design. So this is what you would typically spec on your plans. Now earlier, if you told me that you would not design a concrete parking lot in less than six inches, but this is pretty close to what your asphalt section is, three inches of fine graded asphalt over six inches of crust stone. Based on structural number, you can see that provides a structural number of 1.86. The anecdotal concrete equivalent is gonna be 3.72 inches. So this asphalt section structurally, based on those structural numbers, is equivalent to 3.72 inches of concrete. You'll see that there's a little red um, um, exclamation point there next to the 3.72. It's because if you were to hover it over it, hover over that in the program, it tells you that the, the uh, industry does not recommend anything less than four inches. Now we are not we are not um, suggesting that you would build your project with four inches of concrete, because when you would go to your design that we saw earlier, given the inputs, the traffic soils and um, concrete strength we needed four and a half inches. But what this tells me is this design for the asphalt is under designed. So we cannot do an apples to apples comparison. So if, if I know I ran through this very, very quickly, um, we do webinars specifically on this, this um, tool. Again, this is not a design tool, this is a comparison tool. If you would like a copy of this, if you would like um, another personal webinar to go through the ins and outs of this, Send me an email and we will um, get with you. We'll make sure that you've got it, copy of it, and we can go over how to use this. But again, this is a comparison tool, not a design tool. Our design tool is pavementdesigner.org. Um, this is a free web-based um, um, program that's out there. NRMCA, the Portland Cement Association, and the American Concrete Pavement Association, ACPA, um, all put in a, um, some money, and we, we came up with this um, one-stop shop um, for, for many facets of, of concrete paving. Um, I'm going to, oh, real quick, before I jump into the program, um, I want to direct you to paveahead.com. This is our NRMCA's pavement, local pavings uh, website. If you go down to the resources um, uh, page or tab, under um, the additional resources, if you go at the bottom, you will see um, these headings. You can, uh, this is, will be a link. This concrete industry pavement design tool is a link to pavement designer. So if you forget where to look, that will be a link. There is a free webinar with the slides as well as the recording. So if you wanna find out about that um, software in more detail, uh, you can upload um, that recording and the, the slides and you can follow along. Just like with CPA, once you get in it, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to, to uh, we, can, we can light link in with you and we can kind of discuss the different aspects of it. Um, but it's a very, it's a very good um, tool. So I'm gonna jump out here real quick and I'm gonna go to Pavement Designer uh, for just a few minutes uh, and, and look at this. So again, it's pavementdesigner.org. It's a free website. If you have not ever registered, it's going to look a little bit different than mine. Um, in this middle area right here, register uh, button. When you, um, when, if you have not registered, this this icon right here will look different. It'll be sign in or register. Once you register, it changes to my design. This when, when you register, it gives you the ability then to store all of your concrete designs in one location. These are designs that you see. Um, I don't have access to them. These are your personal. 
launched, um, when you open Pavement Designer, you have three modules. You have the parking module, the streets and local roads module, and then an intermodal module. Um, the parking lot, once you hover over them, it'll, it'll flip up and it tells you exactly what you are going to be designing for. It also tells you the methodology used. So for parking lots, it's going to talk about, it's going to use ACI 330, which is the document that we've been talking about. And it's also going to use Street Pave um, to, to make the calculations behind the scenes. If you go to Streets and Local Roads, there's a lot of stuff that's embedded in the streets module. So look at the flip up panel. Um, you can see here it's um, using um, designing jointed uh, plain concrete pavements. This is also can be used for continuously reinforced um, as well as roller compacted. Um, in this module, you can also um, do overlays. You can design overlay, overlays and you can also design using composite systems. So again, there's a lot that's embedded. So it, it really, it takes a little bit of time to kind of go through and see what all you can do. Uh, mod for the intermodal module, this is more for your heavy duty industrial. This is for um, not over the road um, trucks. So this is looking at your um, your 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 um, forklifts and your container trucks, things like that that have been separated, um, or the container aspect of it. Um, so this that is is a completely separate um, type of um, calculation. And um, we are going to be having a webinar coming up next week on the industrial um, guide that'll be um, that'll be the um, resources here in a minute. But we'll go over the module for the intermodal in that webinar. So that's next Thursday. But getting back to this, when you come into the um, for a parking lot, you can see that the the information that we talked about up to at this point is in here. So if you do a calculation for a light duty uh, parking lot, you pick your traffic, your design life, um, reliability, all of this information, trucks per day, these are all things that we had talked about before. If you have any questions, you can go to the help and you can toggle it on. And then whenever you hover over, it'll um, come pop up and then it'll give you some information on help. Um, there is a resource tab over here. And that has a, a lot of information on it um, that you can download about uh, any of the, the topics that I talked about. Um, it connects to different wiki pages. Um, it's taking a little bit of time to go. Support, if you have any questions, again, about the, present, about the um, software, um, there is a, pin, a point person from each of the associations that you can then get in contact with um, for more information. So that is um, that is um, the that's my portion of the presentation. And Phil's going to finish us out with the NRMCA resources. Uh, I, I do have a. Uh, uh little bit here on some resources uh, the best thing I can tell you is your best resource I think would be to go to paveahead.com reach out to any of the paving experts that are listed there uh, but with regard to that I, I will start with paveahead.com as the best place to to begin uh, it is our newly branded website there's all kinds of great information here uh, you'll see information on concrete overlays of existing asphalt, concrete parking lots, uh, concrete pervious concrete, roller compacted concrete, uh, additional a new section on concrete trails to go along with the new concrete trails design guide. It probably should be the first place you would stop. And while you're here, uh, you can click on the design center. Uh, Amanda talked a little bit about our design center. Uh, it is uh, formally called the Design Assistance Program, but is our concrete pavement design center. We have engineers on staff who will look at your, pro your project, uh, the information that you provide us, and we can make design recommendations for concrete pavement based on ACI 330 designs. Uh, if given the, the information, we can also provide some cost comparisons uh, 
life cycle cost analysis all depends on all the information that you give us mostly what we will do there is is a concrete recommendation and we can take a look at specification review now it will cover conventional concrete both full depth and overlays we can talk about pervious concrete uh, we can show recommendations for roller compacted concrete we can include uh, full depth reclamation uh, beneath the concrete pavement. We can look at uh, what I call composite pavements, perhaps a, a parking lot that might use conventional concrete and pervious concrete. Uh, the, the sky's the limit really at what we can do, but it's all based on what you provide us. The best information we give you comes from the best information you give us. If you provide us the site plan, uh, the geotechnical report, the anticipated traffic count, those are the, the, three, uh, the three main pieces we need that, that Amanda talked about in the tables that are in ACI 330. Additionally, if there's a local specification that needs to be met, if it's a particular project and you have specific asphalt and concrete sections already there, we'll take a look at those, compare them to what ACI says and that also then provides you with a little bit better understanding of, of the design. At a minimum, if we have the site plan and the geotech report, we can still provide recommendations. We've actually done recommendations based on nothing more than a Google Earth photograph. In those cases, we provide a a recommendation based on certain presumptions. In other words, we would say in our cover letter that uh, this is based on the assumption that this project is in such and such an area where the soils are typically this. And this project is one where we would expect we might see this type of truck traffic and so on. And then we would you know, basically say your your mileage may vary. If you provide us more information, we can give you a, a more detailed report. What you will get in the report is thickness recommendations for standard and heavy duty pavements specific to your project based on the, the soil support and the intended traffic. There will also be recommendations on joint spacing. If there are areas that might need edge support or uh, if it's a thick enough pavement that should have some dowel reinforcement, those will be included as well. Also, if you include a, a, a CAD drawing of the, of the project, we can provide a recommended joint pattern, um, the joint plan assistance. Uh, this is some, some contractors actually use this part only of the service in order to help with, with joint layout. And we'll provide recommendations on uh, both contraction and isolation joints. Going back to pave ahead, also on that site, uh, the resources that are available. And we have a, a list of resources for each one of the market areas. This is just an example of what's there. In concrete overlays, for example, there's down, a, a way to, to download the guide to concrete overlays of streets and roads and the guide to concrete overlays of asphalt parking lots, both of which are from the Concrete Pavement Technology Center. Uh, we don't have the actual Guide, uh, ACI guides in concrete parking, but we do have a link there to be able to go to the ACI website and purchase those documents. Also, there's a lot of great support documents there. Uh, just a sample of one here is a, a one-page flyer. If you're in the promotion business, so to speak, uh, you're looking for something to use uh, with your customers, here's a one-page flyer that talks about the benefits of concrete pavement. You can print these out and, and use them as part of your message. And we have some concrete results success stories. Here's one in particular about a concrete overlay that was done for a school district in Illinois. And as a result of doing an overlay, rather than a complete reconstruction, they save $73,000. We have several uh, results like this one that, that um, you can use to, to explain to your customer the, the benefits of concrete. Also on Pave Ahead, of course, uh, our education tab, uh, we have many webinars coming up. We'll be running webinars each week uh, from now through through May, uh, and the, the list of, of webinars is there. The next webinar in our uh, concrete pavement series is the designing industrial 
concrete pavements. That's ACR 330.2 R17, which Amanda did talk about earlier. Uh, this is, uh, I, I like to say this is ACI 330 on steroids. This is a, a new document and it is focused specifically on industrial pavements. Uh, warehouses that are going to see 700 trucks a day, industrial, intermodals, those types of, of pavements that have a lot heavier use uh, involved than a, than a standard concrete pavement. That webinar will be next Thursday, April 9th uh, at 2 o'clock, and you can go to the Pave Ahead site, click on the education tab up above there, and the whole list of webinars are there, and you can click to to register for that. With that, I will say we do have some questions that have come in, and if it works for everyone, I'll read the question, and then Amanda, you can address. Uh, and they're in no uh, certain order here, uh, but the first question I have here is, Amanda, why doesn't the geotech engineer specify concrete strength, joint spacing, joint details, etc.? That might be the million dollar question. <laughs> Well, um, actually, sometimes they do. Um, sometimes if you look at the geotech report and they, um, they will give you all of the information and their recommendation, um, and a lot of times it's done, um, like I had mentioned earlier, with the wrong specific or with the, with the wrong design manual. Um, it's fine if they want to do it. It's great if that's what they've been contracted to do. But our goal as industry professionals is to make sure that the geotechs that are um, retained for that type of recommendation are out using the correct um, design guides. So whether it comes from the, um, the, the geotech engineer, um, again, they a lot of times will say that they don't do the design, that they're just providing the recommendations, and that it's the civil engineers or the designers' um, responsibility. Um, regard, regardless of who, which one of the groups puts down those recommendations on paper, they need to be done with the correct uh, design guides. And so it's extremely important that we communicate to both of those groups um, to do that. Very good, thank you. The question that uh, came in is, uh, are you familiar with internal curing technology in concrete to extend the joint spacing in parking lots? Uh, are you familiar with internal curing and how it reduces all manner of shrinkage and cracking? There is a lot of talk on both the, in, the internal curing um, as well and, and for the in regards to joint spacing as well as fibers even, um, especially sitting on the committees. Um, there's a lot of discussion on that. Um, from a design standpoint, where we are as at NRMCA is we will provide you recommendations based on the, the documents that we have, the most current um, documents that we have. So um, we would not take um, any of the really into consideration as far as um, the joint spacing recommendations um, about prolonging them. We would stick to what the design guide says and then um, remembering that these are recommendations. Um, you know, any of, uh, or, it, or sorry, the ones that we do are recommendations, but um, you can then um, take the information, the research that you find on those particular products, and then um, apply that to your base design. Um, I do know, and like I said, in the, in the rewrite um, of the 08 document, when it comes out, um, there will be some, some information in there about fibers, and I believe that, um, I believe that we are moving the market to potentially extending those joint spaces. Uh, I don't know. Um, personally, I haven't done an extensive amount of research in that, but we, at this point, we stick um, to those guidelines in the 330. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, another here on, um, I think it kind of, res kind of goes to the geotech again. Um, Am I right in assuming that for thickness recommendations, civil and structural engineers would require a K value uh, sub-base bearing capacity? If so, what are the most readily available test methods? Um, I do, um, yes. Uh, generally, the civil does request information. Um, there will be a lot of additional information in a webinar I want to uh, inform you about on the 16th of April, so in two weeks. 
um, at three, at two o'clock, I'm sorry, Eastern time. Um, and it's going to be specifically for um, the soils and looking at the different um, uh, tests available uh, for the subgrade. So um, I'm going to give you that as a, te as a teaser um, to come and join that webinar um, series on the, the 16th. Very good. That was a, that was a great advertisement. A nice segue for us there. Uh, here's a, a good question. I've heard this from others as, in the past as well. Can concrete pavement be designed without reinforcing by increasing the strength of the concrete or the thickness of the concrete? And is this what ACI 330's Table 3.4 is showing us? Okay, let me go back to table 3.4. Okay, so table 3.4, um, again, when you look at the, the criteria for that table, that is for unreinforced concrete. Um, when you start doing the, um, the heavier loads, when you start getting more into the industrial side, um, and you then are given the option whenever dowels become an, an opportunity for you to be able to incorporate in, into your design, you then can potentially reduce the thickness, thickness of your pavement um, by putting in reinforcement. Um, there is an appropriate time um, and location for that reinforcement. Um, if it's strictly an economic thing, then you really want to weigh out like is it is it is it really economical to put in all of the all of the doweling and the reinforcement just to save a half an inch of concrete. Um, as far as the concrete strength, um, yes, you can see that when you look at that chart, if you play with the concrete strength, there is a potential of reducing um, or, or thickening up your concrete section. But we do want to warn you um, not to arbitrarily just make, um, if, if 4,000 is good, that means 5,000 should be better. Um, there is there is a point where you're going to to um, potentially cause harm to your pavement, and you're going to it's going to end up costing you more. So you don't want to go thicker for the for the sole purpose of thinning, or sorry, stronger for the sole purpose for the sole purpose of thinning up your pavement. Um, we typically will um, will see a, a durability would be one of the main one of the big factors of going to a um, higher strength concrete not necessarily a concrete or a, a thickness um, um, reasoning. Thank you. Uh, next question, what is the proper installation method for welded wire mesh in concrete pavement to avoid it from sinking to the bottom of the concrete? Uh, don't include it in your specification. And then that solves all problems right there. Um, really, ACI 330 doesn't talk um, about um, it doesn't really get into uh, to great detail about it, uh, about the construction side of it, just for the fact that it's it's not typically used. We don't n normally see it. Um, you know, the the typical things that we see are you know using your chairs, um, the hooks to pull it up. Um, it's a battle. I think that's the million dollar question when it comes to well, the wire, um, the the mesh or the the um, the reinforcements is how to get it up um, and keep it up in that upper. Um, the upper uh, portion of the concrete. Maybe that's something that someone can improve the chair system on to make it a, a no full system. But to me, the number one way is don't specify it. I, I would agree. I've got three questions on jointing and I'm gonna put all three of them together. Uh, it, the question was, the first question is, um, if I can find it here. I was under the impression that we didn't want to extend the saw cuts deeper than a quarter of the thickness to maintain aggregate interlock. The next question tied in there is why not have joints at a third the thickness? And then the third jointing question I'll put together is do you recommend cutting the welded wire mesh at every concrete joint? I've heard that helps with horizontal movement intended at each joint. As far as the um I'm looking. I'm looking for those now because that was a lot. Um, Let's take each one individually then. First, go, we'll talk go back, about. Yeah, if you can read, if you can redo the, 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 the first fir one. The first one. I was under the impression that we did not want to extend saw cuts deeper than a quarter thickness to maintain aggregate interlock. I guess that's okay, kind that's of right. true or false. Yeah. So um, it really depends on the type of aggregates that are going to be used um, in in the in the actual mix. Um, that's going to be the, really the determinant. 
when you go um, a quarter of the thickness, you've, 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 you're sufficient to provide um, that reduced cross-sectional area um, to encourage those built-up stresses to, to congregate in that area and continue that aggregate interlock. Um, a quarter, again, a quarter of the, I mean, a third of the, the thickness, it's really, we're, we're, there's some, um, the industrial document really goes into it um, quite a bit more as far as um, the recommendations of doing a third, but a lot of it is really going to be dependent on the aggregate uh, types. All right, that kind of answered questions one and two. The third part of that question was, do you recommend cutting the welded wire mesh at every concrete joint? I've heard that helps with horizontal movement intended at each joint. You know, I've, I've heard mixed um, mixed opinions about this one. Um, I, I just went back and looked up at HCI 330. I did not see anything in 330 um, when I looked at the welded wire, um, the re reinforcement seal, distributed seal um, section. I did not see um, where they um, made any uh, mention of it. That's something that I would dig in deeper because I don't want to, I want to make sure that I have the facts for you. So I would look at it, I will be able to look it up and I can get back with the, the original poster um, to, to um, send them to the appropriate section of the document. So uh, I'm going to table that one. We could also go back to your recommendation on not even using well wire using mesh it. and then there you, you wouldn't go. have to worry about that. <laughs> there um, you go. Maybe that's why 330 doesn't address it. Ne our next question, if we talk about steel fiber, they're susceptible to rusting when exposed to moisture. Is it really sustainable to use steel fiber in concrete? Um, this is what I'm going to um, have to defer. Yes, it is going, steel fibers are going to be um, um, susceptible for, um, for that. Um, I will, um, again, I, it's one that I'm going to defer until a later time because I would like to talk with my my steel or my uh, fiber folks. Um, Phil, do you have anything to add on on fibers um, on this question? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I really don't. Um, I know steel fibers are, I think most of the time I see steel fibers used at an interior application, mm -hmm. uh, industrial floors. Uh, not being a chemist, uh, I would maybe throw this out that I, I let me go back to my experience being in the insurance industry. If a boat sank, we left it sank as long as we could in the water because it didn't start to fall apart, didn't start to oxidize until we pulled it out. If you have steel fiber in the concrete and it's held in the concrete uh, without getting air to it as well, it may be less likely to corrode. Um, again, I will probably default to the fiber folks on that to, for, for better clarification, but you know, that would be my, I think the first part of the answer would be, I've not really seen steel used in exterior, more in an interior slab. Uh, I like this question, um, not that I don't like the others, but I think this is a very pertinent question. Pavements designed as recently as 10 years ago are being exposed now to numerous UPS, FedEx, and Amazon delivery trucks. How do you account for the increase in truck traffic? Um, and that's something that needs to be discussed. If we if we have that information ahead of time, we can make those assumptions. Um, when you are doing a design and pavement designer, um, you can allot for a growth percentage. So if this is going to be phase one um, and you're in an industrial area, you can assign a, a growth um, percentage rate to your design so that it will take into account um, bringing on board other, other um, vehicles accessing your roadway. Um, Phil, I just, I have um, a question since I just talked about pavement designer mm -hmm. that someone had. Um, the question was the pavement designer software does not include output results for dial bars. Is there any reason? Um, parking lot module does not um, take into consideration dowels, and the reasoning being in most parking lot, standard parking lot applications, you're not going to have the, the frequency of truck traffic to really warrant dowels. Again, if you start looking at dowels, you're going to look at, um, first of all, the thickness. The thickness for dowels needs to be um, 
for round dials needs to be seven inches or greater. So when you look at that design chart, you're going to have a lot of trucks to get there. Most standard parking lots do not um, have that, that truck frequency. Um, if you go to the streets and local roads, the streets module, and you run through the streets module, you will be given um, the output for dowels. And so it, you can see the comparisons there. Um, one thing that I would caution you about is that um, you will see a dowel recommendation printed on your screen, um, and it may come out like five and a half inches. It's, there's a slight shading over that, um, and so if you were to hover over your mouse over that five and a half inches of dowel um, design, it'll tell you that dowels are not typically recommended and, and something that's that thin. So um, if you're looking for, the, for the, the doweling aspect of it, go to the street module. You can run parking lot traffic um, spectrums in the street module. So if you're looking at doing an, um, a more industrial sites and you want to look at dowels you're going to have over the road um, trucks then use the street module putting in your your parking lot um, traffic designations and then you can run it um, with dowels so that was a long answer to that thank you next question would you use welded wire mesh or rebars for odd shaped sections Um, a lot of times we'll just see the distributed steel put in, in there. I, um, I believe is, is how the majority of the, the industry does it. Um, but like one of our, our fellow um, attendees says, welded wire, don't use it. So um, there's different ways to do it. Um, again, I think it depends on the size, location, what, what um, exactly um, is happening there. I think it's quite common also to sometimes see in those odd shaped sections, you might see welded wire or a particularly fiber used in there. I was getting ready to say a lot of it seems like we're, we're transitioning to a lot more fiber in those areas because they basically will will kind of help um, um, cross over, kind of kind of hold it back together. Stitch it, I guess the word is stitch that I like to use. It stitches it together. Mm -hmm. This next question may be another one that's answered in the soils webinar when it comes up. Uh, but the question is, when it comes to drainage and expansive clay soils, is the NRMCA providing any guidance on how the designer can address these items? Well, being that um, the webinar is put on by Brian Kellingsworth, who lives in Texas, and I hear so much about the, the highly expansive um, Soils there, I can pretty much guarantee you that in that website or in that webinar, you will be, you will be talking about um, highly expansive soils and how to deal with them. So I would I would really defer that because it's it's something that um, we don't really have time to get into here. But um, there is some information um, out there in um, the ACI 330 document, um, but you'll find a lot more information as well in the webinar. Thank you. Uh, next question, what marketplaces in the country have you s ever seen just four and a half to five inches of concrete designed and placed? I think that's a good question because ACI 330 recommends these pavements at four and a half or five inches, and yet we sometimes, the design community has a tendency to think, well, five is good, six is better, so let's design it at six. Do we have experience out there where we've seen ACI 330 recommendations followed and they're using four and a half or five inches of pavement? Yes, and um, I also want to point out, so we have a, um, Phil, I drew a blank, help me with our case studies. We are, um, we are, we are working to compile projects across the United States that Con do Concrete um, tracker. Yes, yeah, so Concrete Tracker, we are, um, we're looking for projects across the U.S. So for those of you in areas um, that have concrete pavements down there, um, if you've designed concrete pavements, um, we're looking for those projects that we can then populate a, a map, uh, an interactive map on the, uh, on the web where you can go in and you can pull down and say, okay, I want all four, four inch thick concrete pavements. And you can see the different um, projects that we've populated the map with, with, with those type projects. Um, I can tell you that that we do we do have four four and a half inch five inch thick uh, concrete sections out there. We see them a lot in banks. Um, we see them in um, the doctor's offices, things like that, where it's it's guaranteed 
that we're going to have, um, you know, typically it's a tighter site. It's not um, necessarily that um, that front road on on uh, in Walmart, um, you know, where it's going to have a lot more of the the truck traffic or the um, even the RV traffic. Um, but really, kind of thinking and, and trying to incorporate what all traffic is going to have access to this site. Um, and saying that, um, when you design your pavement, the the traffic is um, considered. There there are allotments for a truck to have to come into your pavement. So we may say it's it's um, you know a, a, a um, dentist office, um, and so it's not going to see it. But you have to design for at least one truck per day. And so um, that will basically absorb those trucks that go where they're not supposed to go. It does still account for those um, and provide, provide adequate um, structure there. But basically, you're looking at your extremely light duty, you know, your um, public works buildings where it's pretty much just your pickup trucks, the parking lots for, um, for warehouses where it's the employee parking, and then they've got the trucks are all going to another area. Those are, are prime locations. Um, and like I said, throughout we find those throughout the U.S. and and our hope is for anybody that's listening that has designed those four-inch thick pavements um, to let us know about them, and we'd love to showcase those on our um, concrete tracker. What are the effects of equal Portland cement concrete pavement and hot mix asphalt pavement designs relative to site excavation, granular import, etc.? So when you when you compare the thickness of, of a concrete section, so when you compare them structurally, a concrete section to an asphalt section, your asphalt um, thickness is going to be thicker than the concrete section. Again, remembering that that concrete, when it comes to ACI 330 design, it is a a design that is is basically concrete over compact. Um, and so for a, a scenario like we talked about earlier, the example, it was four and a half inches of concrete. So if you're in a, in a, a position of cutting, you would then, um, you know, if say that you are at elevation, for the pavement, um, you would cut the four and a half inches. For the asphalt, you've got every single at three inches of asphalt, six inches of the aggregate base. And then you're looking at a, you know, a, a much thicker pavement. So in excavation, if you're in a cut situation, um, uh, concrete is definitely going to be the more economical uh, way to go. Oh, there we go. I muted myself. Uh, <laughs> also, actually, from the same from the same person, I'm trying to get back to the question. What are your opinions on the value of the maturity curve monitoring? Return to service is a consideration for a lot of clients when assessing asphalt versus concrete? All right, I'm looking for the, the question so I can read it again. I can read it again to you. What are your opinions on the value of maturity curve monitoring? Return to service is a consideration for many clients when assessing asphalt and concrete. It is, um, and we, um, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think I think we're talking maturity testing versus 28-day compressive strength. And, you know, people think you can't drive on the concrete for 28 days because we got to get up to strength, so. Exactly, and that's what I was, gonna, I was going to address is a lot of times that there is the misconception that concrete, um, you know, cannot be open for 28 days. Um, for those of you in the municipality world, um, when we talk about concrete paving, uh, a lot of times it's it's that not being able to open it up as fast as you can um, with other paving materials. And we absolutely can open it up um, quick. Um, you know, there's admixtures out there and whatnot that can get us open a lot quicker. So um, I, I definitely think it's important to um, to a, to do the, the proper testing to get it open um, as quick as possible. And you don't have to wait in for the 28-day the day. Um, strength to be to be gained. I think we've got time for one more question here. There are a couple of other questions that haven't been answered. Uh, I apologize we didn't have time for all of them. Any question that we have not answered here, we will respond directly to the person who's asked uh, through an email. But the last question we've got here is, um, 
I'm often required to design even a lighter duty pavement area to accommodate fire trucks. I think what they're saying is even when they're looking at a lighter area, they're required to design it to accommodate fire trucks. You are talking one truck a day. Would that include a design for emergency vehicles? So we um, we look at emergency vehicles a little bit differently. Um, if you've ever, um, and I never have really paid attention to emergency vehicles until I started uh, this, this um, design, but if you've ever looked at um, fire trucks, for instance, there's um, a whole assortment of different uh, con configurations of the, of the different types of fire trucks. Um, what I would say is that, well, first of all, in the, um, the revision of the, the 330 document, um, there is going to be a traffic category specifically for fire trucks. So if you are designing a fire truck, you can go in, select that designation, and you can see what that thickness would be required to be. Um, until that point, I would, I would highly recommend that when you are doing a pavement design, um, find out, you can call the local fire department if you aren't sure, what type of trucks they typically run. Um, or you can just do an assumption um, of one. And then at that point, you can get the axle configurations and the weight of those trucks so that you can do a very precise design to make sure that you're not designing for a truck um, that's maybe you know a small truck, not um, a whole lot of ladder extensions on it, um, because that, those things can get pretty heavy um, and, and um, can do a lot of damage to the pavement. Um, so you may want to do um, basically in pavement designer, you would go in and you would um, create a um, a different axle con load dis uh, configuration for that specific vehicle. Um, it sounds a little, a little complicated. Again, that's one of those things that um, if the webinar for that does not uh, address it, feel free to give us a call um, and we can walk through on how to um, put in a custom vehicle. But that's, that's typically how we would look at it um, if we're going to um, design it specifically for that in mind until we have the new um, document that will allow us to, to um, do it in, on, on paper, design on paper. Well, very good. Thank you very much, Amanda. I want to thank you for a, a great presentation, very informative. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope that you got a lot out of the program. A reminder that we do have another webinar next Thursday, uh, and it would be Designing Industrial Pavements, ACI 330.2 R17. Uh, hopefully as informative as the one you saw today, you can go to paveahead.com click the education tab and you should be able to register there. With that, I'll say once again, thank you much. Have a great day. We hope everyone stays safe out there. Take care. Thank you guys.